the Delaware River. Sorry, I forgot to hit the record button before. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, of the Delaware Regiment, the Delaware Blues in 1776, which was this elite unit started out as the largest uh, regiment in Washington's army and um, was probably, uh, along with the, the Maryland Regiment, perhaps the most um, respected or admired uh, unit in the Continental Army in 1776. But um, by the time we get to the Battle of Princeton, which is where Hazlitt um, meets his fate, uh, his regiment has shrunk from the original 750, which made it in the beginning, probably the largest regiment in Washington's army, uh, to six men, including Hazlitt. And so there's this, um, uh, parallel uh, track, I suppose you could say, between you know the, the demise of that original regiment and unfortunately the demise of Colonel Hazlitt. But um, he was, I think, as zealous a supporter of what Washington called the glorious cause, meaning American independence, as you could find anywhere. And um, he was a stalwart. Um, as was his regiment, and I think there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that had he lived, he would have been promoted to uh, general in fairly short order and, and would have been a very fine one. So <clears throat> there's a reason why I'm going through all of this exercise. So we have unsung heroes in rescuing the revolution, Edward Hand in the Battle of Assunpink Creek in your second book, and then John Hazlitt. Uh, another sort of unsung hero who uh, became an early martyr. And now we move to the Battle, Battle of Harlem Heights with Thomas Knowlton. So you seem to have this knack of picking both battles and patriots who really have not gotten their due. Um, you're, are, are you... Are, are you a glutton for punishment? What, what, where, what, <laughs> tell me, please, <laughs> how, well, how is um, it that you're, you're picking up on all of these people? Yeah, after, after writing four books, I would not deny that I'm a glutton for punishment. But um, <laughs> as, as you may recall, the idea for writing um, a book about the Battle of Harlem Heights uh, did not come from me <laughs> originally. Um, I was, this goes back to, I guess, um, the fall of 2021. And I was working on a manuscript for a book that was intended to be a biography of Thomas Knowlton of Connecticut, another unsung, as you said. And um, that was what I, I really, you know, was, um, had my heart set on doing. And I guess I had in mind that that would be the fourth uh, collaboration, um, if that's the proper uh, term to use um, between you and I, that uh, did not come to pass, but be that as it may, this was one of those cases where, you know, one door closed and another opened. And it was opened by Bruce Franklin, the publisher at Westholm, who after reading an article that I wrote for the Journal of the American Revolution, which West Home owns, about Thomas Knowlton, which I was intending to be kind of a lengthy abstract for the book I wanted to write. Um, Knowlton was mortally wounded at Harlem Heights, and Bruce had it in mind to include a book about the Battle of Harlem Heights in the small battle series that West Home launched in March 2020 right before COVID hit. So um, when he approached me and he came, he came through you, as you'll recall, you were the, you were the conduit. Right. And you contacted me and you said, you conduit. So <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the opening, opening one. Um, so I wasn't really enthused about it. You know, I thought of it as a, you know, another Rodney Dangerfield battle, but um, from what little I knew of it, but uh, when I talked to him, to Bruce, and I explained that if I were to write the book, 
I would like to use it as a vehicle for promoting the historical profile of Knowlton, at least as much as the Battle of Harlem Heights. And he was fine with that. And the series, Small Battle series editors, um, Mark Lender and Jim Martin, James Kirby Martin, who, as you know, are very distinguished Revel War historians, they were on board with the idea. And so um, it took off from there. So um, I, I, I realize this is going to sound like another commercial uh, for The Crossing and the Ten Crucial Days, the musical. But one of the most searing songs, I think, in the entire musical is a book, uh, Will They Remember Our Names? And um, so this very long introduction that I've embarked upon here with David to talk about uh, his books, the unsung heroes, and these unsung battles, really. Um, and I commend David. These are great reads. Um, I remind everybody that you can go to historyauthortalks.com and just click on the bookshop and you can purchase David's books or you can get them anywhere, um, anywhere where you buy your books. Uh, they always have them at the Washington Crossing Historic um, uh, Park gift shop uh, where David is an interpreter. So uh, you can always contact the Washington Crossing Historic uh, Park. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to ask you, David, so tell us, who is Thomas Knowlton? How did he get to uh, join Washington and the Continental Troops on um, New York and the New York campaign? Yeah. Well, um, Knowlton was a, a remarkable individual. Um, and I think if this book does nothing else but you know, enhance his um, his historical profile, give me his just due. I'll be immensely gratified about that. He um, actually, if it's okay with you, what I'd like to do is is because uh, I think it's on point here is read an excerpt, yeah, uh, a couple of excerpts from the book um, from this sure. book um, about Nolan's service in the Revolution, which was over a, a remarkably short period of time, less than a year and a half, about seventeen months, and. Um, I'd like to read this because the author says it better than I can. Um, all right, during which time he was promoted from captain to major to lieutenant colonel and earned the respect and admiration and acclaim of virtually everyone in the army from uh, GW down to the, the, the lowliest private who served under Knowlton. Um, and during, in the course of writing the book, one of the editors, Jim Martin, suggested, and I thought it was a great suggestion. I picked up his ball and ran with it. He um, was saying, um, if I in interpreted him correctly, at least this is how I chose to interpret, that Knowlton deserved equivalent stature, if you will, with the likes of uh, Dr. Joseph Warren, the one of the leaders of the New England Rebellion, um, in the early days of the conflict, who was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill in 1775. And uh, General Richard Montgomery, one of the leaders of the American invasion of Canada, who was killed uh, in the early morning hours of uh, New Year's Day, 1776, during the attack on Quebec City. They were both about the same age as Knowlton uh, when they met their fate in their early to mid 30s. And um, I think you can make a very strong argument that Knowlton uh, really belongs right up there with them. So um, anyway, so let me let me read this this pertinent paragraph and then a second uh, excerpt that I think it it ties in with uh, nicely. Consider Knowlton's record in the emergent struggle. He led the first armed contingent from outside Massachusetts into that colony to join the militia there in the wake of the opening shots at Lexington and Concord. He devised a novel rail fence that successfully resisted assault at the Battle of Bunker Hill and orchestrated a stubborn defense of his sector against the British attack. 
which prevented the Americans from being outflanked and enabled Knowlton's men to provide protective cover for the retreat from the rebel redoubt on Breed's Hill. He spearheaded a daring raid against the enemy at Charlestown that largely achieved its objective while barely firing a shot and without losing a single soldier. He organized an elite intelligence and reconnaissance unit at Washington's direction that has earned Knowlton recognition as the father of American military intelligence and which included the young Captain Nathan Hale, whom posterity crowned with the levels of legendary heroism. And finally, he created the opportunity for and helped lead a successful counterattack at Harlem Heights that repelled the British in open field combat for the first time and boosted the faltering confidence of Washington's army. And that leads me into my second excerpt, which is actually the last, um, the last source note uh, in the last, uh, well, the last source note in the book. Um, hopefully this, what I'm about to read will not be uh, excessively provocative to anyone. One can be forgiven for questioning why the Connecticut General Assembly designated Nathan Hale as the state's sole official hero in 1985 and thereby consigned his superior officer, Colonel Knowlton, to relative obscurity. Notwithstanding Hale's unquestioned bravery and commitment to the revolution, what he accomplished in its service pales beside Knowlton's record. A dispassionate consideration of the respective contributions by these two martyrs to the Patriot cause can yield only one conclusion. There is simply and emphatically no comparison between them. Replacing one man with the other as the official state hero at this point would presumably be problematic for some. But at the very least, Colonel Knowlton deserves equal billing with Captain Hale. Why not have a pair of state heroes? As they were connected in life, so let them be for eternity, at least in Connecticut. Parsons of Israel, uh, excuse me, partisans of Israel Putnam clearly have a case to make for their man, but the argument for Knowlton and Hale rests on their having made the ultimate sacrifice for the cause in which all three were engaged. I'll step down off my soapbox now. Well, <laughs> and um, John Resto, who I'm sure you probably know is a regular listener and visitor at all of our parks also uh, concurs <laughs> as, he, as he writes to us in the uh, chat, he was a failure uh, as a spy, an example of what not to do. And I'm afraid that's that's true. <laughs> he, he was uh, singularly unqualified for the mission, but um, Knowlton chose him because Washington needed a spy and Hale was the only one right. in his unit who volunteered to do it. Sure. All right, so let's. So you've established uh, Knowlton um, showed his uh, showed his worth at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, that report obviously went to Washington, and as we all know, Washington had a real knack for picking out young talent. Um, in um, April of 1776, after the um, after the evacuation of the British in Boston. Uh, Washington marched the troops to the uh, post of most in port down to Wash down to New York, um, and um, then in you know a few short weeks after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, we have the um, New York campaign. Let's take a look at the let's take a look at the um, what the New York campaign looks like, and uh, let everyone know sort of what. What happened in in uh, Brooklyn and uh, Manhattan at this point? So, um, oh yeah, first tell have... everyone what tell everyone a little bit about this this famous painting, right? Why it's significant to this story? Yeah, um, this is one of the illustrations in the book, and um, the painting is by John Trumbull, um, entitled "The Death of." General uh, Warren or Joseph Warren. Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill, comma, June 17, 1775. Interestingly enough, he painted this in London uh, after the war. It was the first in a series of um, 
artistic masterpieces that he would create that were part of his design to give us a visual uh, record of the um, of the conflict. So what's most interesting or, or salient about the painting um, in, in the, uh, the context that we're discussing here is that the gentleman on the left standing up right uh, holding the musket that's pointed at the British is Thomas Knowlton. Um, right, and here's his, his birth date and, and the date of death. So in the painting, uh, both, and it, you know, reeks of symbolism, obviously, both Warren and Knowlton and this unnamed militiaman in bare feet who's uh, crad crad excuse me, cradling Warren in his arms are all wearing white. Um, and Knowlton uh, holding his musket aimed at the British presumably is, is to suggest that they were out of ammunition at that point, I guess. But the fact that um, Trumbull, who was also from Connecticut and uh, may very well have, have known Knowlton, I, I don't know how well, but um, the fact that he portrayed him so prominently in the painting suggests that, uh, I think is suggestive of, of what he thought of Knowlton. Um, I mean, he's got Knowlton there even um, more prominent than um, uh, uh, William Prescott, who's, I guess, two, two people behind him, uh, who was commanding the, uh, well, depending on whose account you read, at least one of the commanders of the um, American uh, forces at Bunker Hill. But, you know, he's got Knowlton in the foreground and um, this image of Knowlton, which, as I understand it, is thought to be a, a pretty good likeness, uh, of, uh, probably a very good likeness of him. Uh, yeah, that image was the basis for the print that you see on the right of Knowlton, and also the basis for a statue of Knowlton that has been, uh, well, yeah, this is what Washington had to say about Knowlton on the day after the battle. Right, there's the statue of uh, Knowlton that has been standing on the grounds of the Connecticut State Capitol in Hartford since 1895. It's um, eight feet tall, or that is the, the figure of Knowlton on the pedestal is 18 uh, feet tall. I think it's 16 feet altogether. The facial likeness of him again is based on the Trumbull painting. Um, this was created by a sculptor named Enoch Smith Woods, who, um, I guess fittingly enough or interestingly enough, also speaking of our friend Nathan Hale, um, prior to this created a statue of Hale, which also stands uh, in the Capitol, uh, I believe not, not that far away from, from where the Knowlton statue is. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about, I mean, just very quickly, um, because obviously we wanna focus on Harlem Heights but I, I just wanted to show the overview of the entire campaign, uh, the New York uh, campaign. So we signed the Declaration of Independence. One month later, the 35,000 British, British and Hessian auxiliaries land on Staten Island. And in um, August 22nd, they land uh, basically at the... Um, Coney, on Coney Island here. Um, <laughs> so uh, what happens between the 22nd and the 27th? Well, the 27th, of course, is the, the, uh, the Battle of Long Island or the, ba the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, and um, during that time, the, the British are preparing their assault. They've landed their troops and 20,000 troops on uh, Long Island, I don't think because of the inadequate intel that Washington had, he wasn't sure quite how many enemy troops had actually landed on Long Island. I gather that right up until the day of the battle, he was convinced that what that that Howe had only landed part of his army on Long Island, that that was a feint, that he was trying to distract Washington from um, Howe's real target, which was to um, attack Washington on, on Manhattan Island, then known as New York Island or York Island, um, 
presumably via the, the Hudson River, then known as the North River. And so uh, Washington was really didn't, obviously didn't know quite what to do. You know, he had about half his army uh, on Long Island. He sent some, uh, sent over some reinforcements prior to the battle, but still kept uh, half his army on Manhattan Island. So he was splitting his forces in the face of a militarily superior opponent, which is obviously a cardinal no-no. Um, uh, Knowlton's, uh, Knowlton's Rangers, which were the first uh, intelligence unit in the Continental Army, and as such, the first intelligence unit, U.S. Army intelligence unit, which is why he's known today as the father of American military intelligence. Uh, he had formed this elite unit at Washington's direction out of Washington's desperate need for intelligence uh, shortly before the, um, the Battle of Long Island and um, mid, around mid-August. And they didn't get over to the island to do their thing, which was, uh, you know, reconnaissance, uh, scouting, that sort of thing, uh, until the day before the battle. So they really weren't able to, you know, to do anything. I mean, they were there during the battle on the twenty uh, on the twenty seventh, but really not that involved in the action. Although some of them may have come pretty close to being captured. But um, so if we look at if we look at the placement of Washington's army, he feels right. he's got, he feels he has his army stretched out um, in a defensive position on the high ground on the, on Gowanus Heights. And yeah. there, they were uh, spread out uh, from west to east along the heights. And there were four pathways really that the enemy could potentially take One, to, to, uh, through the alignment. I mean, going from west two. to east, there was the Gowanus Road, the, um, the Flatbush Road, the Bedford Pass, and the Jamaica Pass all the way on the right. You can see the Jamaica Pass on the right. And that was the key to the battle because General Howe, at the suggestion of General Henry Clinton, and this is probably the only time in the war he ever took uh, Clinton's suggestion, but it proved to be fortuitous to Howe. He um, took, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, about 10,000 men up the Jamaica Pass overnight on the night of the 26th and 27th, um, Israel Putnam, who was commanding the American troops on Long Island at that point, uh, he was the third commander whom Washington had appointed in five days, not a great way to uh, run, run the railroad, had uh, neglected to provide for adequate security there. It was guarded, if you will, by five mounted militia. So Howe's column obviously you know, swept past them. And then at 9 a.m. on the morning of August 27th, when he reached his um, his objective behind the American center, he sounded a cannon, which alerted the British, British and Hessian forces below the Guanas Heights that uh, the fix was in and they had the Americans right where they wanted them. And that was the key to the battle, that flanking move. Fortunately for the Americans, uh, most of the most of the troops, uh, American troops, were able to escape back into the fortifications on Brooklyn Heights. Right. And so the result was, from a tactical standpoint, a smashing success for Howe's army, perhaps the most clear cut, clear cut excuse me, tactical success on any uh, British success on any in any open field battle during the war. But from a strategic standpoint, um, it was a bust because you still had um, most of uh, the American forces who were on that side of the East River, on the Long Island side of the East River, uh, ensconced in their fortifications on Brooklyn Heights. And General Howe, for whatever reason, uh, we could get into an extended discussion just on this point alone, did not choose to uh, to push it that day to, to continue the assault and try to, uh, to take the heights, um, figuring presumably that the Americans were trapped, that um, the Royal Navy, was, which had command of the navigable waters around Manhattan Island, including the East River, would be able to you know, bottle up the Americans on Brooklyn Heights. But that was not the case um, on the night of August 29th, Washington's army was able to pull off a miraculous escape, probably one of the most 
miraculous in uh, military history across the East River from Brooklyn Heights to Manhattan, more or less in the area where uh, or near where the uh, Brooklyn Bridge is today. Um, and uh, he was able to, to rescue virtually um, the entire force that he had with him on the east side of the river. Now we want to we want to get up to Harlem as quickly as we can here. So just to sort of cut to the chase, Washington not really knowing where the British would then land, as you can see, spreads his troops all the way up the island here. Uh, took a few weeks, but how finally launches this amphibious attack in Kipps Bay and which sends the Americans running up the the what is today Broadway, um, trying to escape being trapped. And Washington sets up defenses on the next piece of high ground, which brings us to Harlem Heights. So here we are on right. Harlem Heights and um, what lead us through the, the next actions here. Yeah, so this shows where the uh, British invaded New York Island on September 15th, uh, where 34th Street is today uh, in uh, East Manhattan. Now, on that day, the Americans, or as of that day, the Americans were in the process of evacuating the remaining troops from New York City at the southern tip of the island, which occupy less than a square mile, uh, less, uh, less than one tenth of the entire land area of the island. Um, had Howe waited another couple of days, he had already waited mm, about two and a half weeks after the Americans had evacuated Brooklyn Heights to launch this invasion. Um, but had he waited another couple of days, presumably the Americans would, it, would have been able to complete their evacuation from the city. As it was, when the British came ashore, there were still about 3,000, at least 3,000 American troops in New York City and a lot of material, um, over half their cannon, 67 field pieces, tents, and lots of other you know, useful things that an army could would want to have, which were lost uh, because Putnam's force had to evacuate the city uh, with great expedi uh, expedition when the British landed. Uh, fortunately for Putnam, the British took their sweet time uh, moving inland. So they came ashore in two waves or two divisions. The first one was in the morning, about 4,000 men, Kipps Bay, followed by another 9,000 in the afternoon. But that second wave didn't finish coming ashore till about five o'clock. As a result, um, Putnam was able to escape uh, basically by the skin of his teeth up the Bloomingdale Road on the west side of the island. There were then two, two main, <clears throat> excuse me, two main roads on the island, Bloomingdale Road on the west, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Post Road on the east. The Post Road was actually the only road that ran the length of the island from New York City all the way up to King's Bridge, which you can't see on this map because it's at the very northern tip of the island um, where you had the connection to the mainland. Yeah, you can't even see it on this map. Um, but the American forces retreated up those two thoroughfares. And what happened on the 15th, the day before the battle, really was, um, it's been referred to as the Battle of Kipps Bay, but it's probably not fair to call it a battle because it was really just a disorganized, uh, it was a rout and a disorganized flight by American troops up to Harlem Heights, where Washington already had uh, positioned um, most, of his, most of his troops. He also had some troops up at King's Bridge, but the largest section of his army uh, was on Harlem Heights because he had identified that um, quite readily, since it was pretty obvious this was the case, as the best defensive position he could find on the island. So he established his headquarters had established his headquarters um, prior to the British landing at the Morris Jumel Mansion, which is open uh, to the public today, is supposed to be the oldest house uh, in Manhattan. And then the American forces on the Heights were positioned from um, 
about 160th Street at the northern end down to about 125th Street on the, the, the southern end, uh, where you had bluffs that were in some cases 60 feet tall. And as you can see on the map, Washington had three divisions positioned on the heights. He had General Joseph Spencer's division. Uh, he had General Israel Putnam's division. And then below them, to the south of them, he had General Nathaniel Green's division, which was comprised largely of New Englanders, um, with the exception of uh, some Maryland units. But they were uh, guarding the, the southern edges of the American encampment, just above this small valley known as the Hollow Way, so, which is uh, which is where the the, the fighting would uh, would begin. So I just want to show this second version of the same map. So here you had the heights. Uh, this this sort of shows the the difference between uh, in terms of topography. Here, this is the hilly area, and Washington was back up further up the Bloomingdale Road. I'm sorry, the Post Road, and the Americans had the defenses up on the heights here, Putnam and Green, and then this was called the Hollow Way, um, which um, now is that. It's not as high as 125th Street, is it? Uh, the Holloway was about, yeah, it's about 125th Street. Yeah. So yeah. Um, So there, there's your three divisions who were protecting the heights, Washington thinking that there's no way that the British would be able to, to, um, to go through that Holloway and then up through the heights. But tell us what happened. Yeah, well, without going into too much too much detail because I don't want to give away everything, but yeah. um, the action started because it, let me say there, there's no uh, nothing in the historical record that suggests that General Howe, who had established his headquarters um, down on 51st Street at the Beekman House, nothing to indicate that he was actually planning uh, any further action on Monday, September 16, 1776 to follow up on the uh, success of his army the day before. But of course, Washington didn't, didn't know that. So he's up at his headquarters at the Morris uh, Mansion. And from there, he can look uh, to the south uh, southwest uh, on the Harlem Plains, and he can see that he has a clear view and he can see what's going on. But if he looks in the other direction, southwest towards the river, because of the uh, the tree cover that was there at the time, he has no idea. He can't tell from there uh, whether or not the enemy might be planning something. So he dispatched uh, in the early morning hours of the 16th, and when I say early morning, you know, before dawn, Knowlton's Rangers to uh, do their thing, to uh, uh, conduct a uh, reconnaissance mission. This was actually the first time, um, well, it would yeah, the first time that that uh, Knowlton's Rangers were in action um, on the field together, it was a newly formed unit, and as I mentioned, they they did, weren't really involved in the uh, the fighting at uh, Long Island. So um, they descended the heights early in the morning. They uh, proceeded through the Hollow Way and advanced southwest. They got as far as about 106, 106th street, excuse me, uh, where they were on the farm of Nicholas Jones. And at that point, they were sighted by British pickets who were at about 104th street. And the, uh, the, the pickets who were anchoring the left line or the west line of the, uh, the Crown's forces that at that point stretched across the island from west to east, um, they, um, when they spotted Knowlton's Rangers, they, um, you know, set off an alarm and um, about 400 British light infantry in response came rushing up the road to deal with these intruders and um, Knowlton's Rangers, rather than doing what the American troops had, most of the American troops had done uh, in their the previous encounters with the enemy at Long Island and at Kipps Bay, did not run away. They stood their ground and they exchanged fire. Although they were outnumbered at this point, more than three to one, they out, uh, exchanged fire 
with the British light infantry for about a half hour. But then Knowlton could see that um, British reinforcements were coming up on his left, specifically the 42nd Highlanders, uh, the Black Watch, who you could see in that, that print that was momentarily showing on the screen, um, which is from a later stage in the battle. Yeah, there's the Black Watch. Now this is from later on in the battle when you see them actually retreating uh, before the Americans. But um, I don't wanna get ahead of myself here, but anyway, so uh, Noton could see that he was gonna be outflanked. Uh, he and his men pulled back to their original starting point. It was an orderly withdrawal. They weren't uh, fleeing by any means. It was a fighting retreat uh, back to the Heights. And at that point, um, Washington was there. He had come down from his headquarters to the Southern Bluffs uh, where Green's division was because he could hear the shooting and he wondered what was going on. Um, and at that point, he conferred with General Joseph Reed, his adjutant general, meaning the chief administrative officer for, for his army. Reed had, when he heard the shooting, he was uh, conferring with Washington and with Washington's consent, he had gone to investigate what was going on. Uh, he met up with Knowlton and uh, he knew you know, what had happened and he conferred with, Reed conferred with Washington about 9 a.m. in the morning. And uh, what happened was what set the stage for the next um, next part of the battle, if you will, the main part of the battle was that, um, and there's you know, been some dispute about this and controversy about this. The British Light Infantry who had chased Knowlton's men back to the Heights um, and they were now on Claremont Hill, they were below the Hollow Way they were a little north of where Grant's tomb is today. Um, but, you know, from their standpoint, they had beat the Americans one more time. You know, this was the third time since uh, August 27th. And so, um, you know, they were seemingly spoiling for a fight. And a British bugler who spotted Washington um, sounded the, the um, I forget the name of it, but the, um, fox call if you will, uh, you will what you would do on a, on a fox hunt uh supposedly when you spotted the fox well uh the fox in this case was washington and uh the buglers allegedly were letting their their men know that washington was on the scene well um colonel reed uh, washington's adjutant general when he heard this was in high dudgeon he thought this was very insulting to the commander in chief and told Washington that and said, you know, you got to do something, you got to respond. So, you know, Washington was kind of on the horns of a dilemma at this point. On the one hand, he did not want to risk a large scale military conf confrontation with the British uh, because he knew at that point his, his army just wasn't prepared for that, to do that. They were still licking their wounds from the previous day's events. On the other hand, um, I think he was persuaded by, uh, by Reed that not to respond at all would just feed into the, the despondency, the low morale that his troops were already feeling. And he wanted to do something to give them an emotional lift. So he came up with, I think, what he thought was a compromise solution, a scheme to um, lure the light infantry into a trap whereby the Americans would um, catch them in the rear and um, cut them off from the main body of their troops and supposedly do this, this is like trying to thread a needle, supposedly do this without drawing in enough enemy reinforcements to provoke a large scale battle which could have disastrous repercussions for Washington's army. So that was his design, that was what he he said, he wrote about it subsequently that that was what he intended to do. And from there, um, you know, developed the main action of the battle, which ultimately would become a larger scale military action than Washington intended in terms of the number of troops involved. Um, you know, at its height, I think you had probably at least 3,000 soldiers on both sides uh, fighting. So, you know, if this was a skirmish, it was a very big skirmish. And um, I don't think Washington intended it for it to get so big. But, um, you know, 
to that extent, maybe things got a little out of hand. Um, his plan was to stage a feint in the front of the British who were on Claremont, which he did uh, with General John Nixon's uh, Massachusetts uh, Brigade to try to lure the British into the hollow way. And then at the same time, in order to spring the trap shot, what Washington did was he dispatched Colonel Knowlton with about 230 men on a flanking maneuver, uh, starting out at about 127th Street, uh, Point of Rocks, as it was known then, to circle uh, with the intent of circling behind the British light infantry. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, and there are, you know, various suggestions out there as to why this happened, um, it didn't work. They, Milton's force wound up, they didn't get in the rear of the light infantry. Instead, they wound up attacking them on their right flank. And in the course of that action, Knowlton and his second in command, Major Andrew Leach of Virginia, were both mortally wounded. Uh, fortunately for the uh, American cause, their men did not break and run at that point, but they put up perhaps in, you know, uh, as a way to, to try to revenge the loss of those two officers, they fought um, you know, more gall gallantly or with more determination than ever. And uh, so the Americans did have the British at that point, the light infantry outnumbered, excuse me, um, the British did bring in some additional reinforcements, both British and Hessian troops. The main part of the fighting occurred, excuse me, between the hours of noon and, and 2 p.m. That two hour stretch was the most intensive point of the fighting with the most troops involved on a buckwheat field, which was on the top of a hill below Claremont Hill, um, that was probably, I think that was about between 120th and 116th streets. The fighting lasted there for about two hours. Then by, by 2 p.m., the British were running low on ammunition. Um, they were outnumbered. They began to fall back. An orderly withdrawal. Uh, this was, was not a flight. Um, at that back, back they can, went back to their original line about, about 106th Street. So at the end of the day, no, really no, they wound up back where they had started. Uh, at about this time, Washington could see that British reinforcements were coming up um, under General Cornwallis, the Corps de Reserve, which had been advancing over about a three mile stretch. And if all those British reinforcements got into the action, you would have had about 5,000 men um, on the Crown side fighting about maybe 2,000 Americans. So Washington obviously wanted to avoid that scenario. And at that point, he ordered uh, his various unit commanders to pull back. Uh, his army fell back to Harlem Heights. And, um, you know, they had their transient um, morale boost. Well, they had the, it was a morale boost in that this battle lasted for a few hours, which was, you know, up to that point was really quite amazing that the Americans were able to withstand the uh, attack of the British light infantry for that period of time. Um, and really, we have the opposite thing that happened here that happened to Bunker Hill. In Bunker Hill, the Americans ran out of ammunition. And here you had the uh, main force of the British Light Infantry who actually ran out of uh, ran out of ammunition and had to fall back. But fall back they did. And um, this that was the morale boost. Um, and that really, wouldn't you say, is you know Knowlton's legacy in that he, he was the one who really sort of pushed this if we want to call this a victory, do we go, do we call this a victory? You know, I, I would say this was a Pyrrhic victory because of the loss of uh, officers like Knowlton and, and uh, Leach, who were among the best regimental commanders that uh, Washington's army had. When you consider the fact that no ground changed hands uh, in the course of the act at the end of the day. Um, and it, this event did nothing, as we know, to alter the course of the New York campaign. Um, you can make a case that, you know, Washington, by initiating this action, was, as somebody put it, poking a stick in a hornet's nest. 
and he was really lucky that he didn't get stung. Uh, so, you know, if you ask me, should he have actually fought the battle? I don't know. You know, I could go either way, kind of 50 50. Having said that, I think the action is significant. Um, and not just because it was the first victory by US Army troops in, in an you know, open field contest, but because it was a harbinger of things to come. This, I think, gives you the first um, foretaste, if you will, of the, you know, what the Continental Army was going to become as it would gradually evolve into a, a proficient fighting force. And here you had men from different regions, from New England, from Maryland, from Virginia, collaborating successfully in this action. And men who prior to the revolution would not have, you know, presumably identified themselves as Americans or as being part of a, a national entity, uh, in this case, a, a national army, but who would have identified with their individual colonies. Uh, but here, you know, they were fighting together and they were learning, you know, how to be soldiers. So what what surprised you the most in your in researching this book? Uh, I mean, other than learning that Nathan Hale is the official state hero of Connecticut. <laughs> um, I suppose the number of soldiers involved. Um, I didn't th I hadn't thought it was, you know, quite as big an action as it was. Um, I don't think I, um, I know this is a surprise, but I don't, I don't think I fully appreciated the, um, the significance uh, of it uh, in the, in the, you know, in the terms that I just discussed. Um, and, you know, as you, as you might imagine, given all that um, and the work that I did on it, I, I have a much more healthy respect for the, you know, for this action than I did. Um, and, and just to do one, with one, maybe end with one quick story, because uh, I really love this. It's from Joseph Plum Martin's celebrated, you know, memoirs, uh, perhaps the most famous by any, you know, American uh, combatant in the war. He was at Harlem Heights. He was part of the 5th Connecticut State Levies, uh, provincial troops uh, serving under uh, uh, Colonel William Douglas. And uh, he writes that after the, the action was over, the Harlem Heights action, um, one of his, one of the men in his unit was complaining about being hungry. And an officer who was present pulled from his, uh, from his pocket an ear of Indian corn that was burnt black as coal, gave it to the complainant and said, here, eat this and learn to be a soldier. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, you know, once again, um, I applaud your ability to uh, have uh, taken a subject and a character, if we want to call him a character, a patriot, who um, who doesn't get the uh, the kind of attention that so many of the uh, the headliners do, you know, what we call the founding fathers, and put together just one of the things I love about your books, David, is that they're just great storytelling. Um, it's it's a wonderful narrative. And I highly recommend it. Um, I, I think everyone should have the opportunity to, you know, read David's books. Uh, they're all available anywhere where books are sold. Um, you should also sign up for David's uh, um, uh, um, David's newsletter. Um, he he writes some great articles, and uh, if you go to dpauthor.com, uh, you'll be able to to um, sign up for his his newsletter and um, uh, get some of his articles that he he comes up with. So I I recommend that as well. Um, so I want to thank you, David, for giving us this time this evening. There's so much more in this story. Uh, if you want to know the story of Mrs. Mary Murray, 
uh, and how uh, she may or may not have outwitted General Howe. You're just going to have to go by the bottle, the Battle of Bar Harlem Heights. And um, I think with that, um, I want to say thank you to David. Uh, next week, we have something a little bit different. Joel Richard Paul on a uh, fascinating book on Daniel Webster called Indivisible and the Rise of American Nationalism. Um, move into the early republic. So I invite you all to join me there. Um, I certainly hope that everyone will uh, continue to look at the calendar at uh, 10 crucialdays.org that lists all of the actions and activities that are happening at Washington Crossing Historic Park, Washington Crossing State Park in New Jersey, the Old Barracks Museum in Trenton, and the Princeton Battlefield. Um, and as always, uh, you know, I I don't mind if people want to contribute to 10crucialdays.org. Uh, we, we love um, telling this story. David tells the story. I tell the story. We've got some wonderful other uh, public historians uh, at Washington Crossing Historic Park and Princeton Battlefield. And it, it helps the cause. It helps us all uh, get the word out. So I want to thank you all for joining us this evening on History Author Talks. And uh, if you want to, if you want to stay on, um, I'm going to close the show by uh, giving you an exclusive look um, at some video that we um, taped uh, for an upcoming Zoom program highlighting. Uh, the Thomas Paine celebration. This is going to be on January 29th. Um, and if um, you stay, if you go to, uh, I, I'm going to be sending out something on History Author Talks, the History Author Talks mailing list about this event. Uh, but uh, we're going to have uh, representatives from Congress um, who have put through legislation on a Thomas Paine. Um, uh, statue. Uh, and uh, we have, since Thomas Paine is the, one of the main uh, focuses on our musical, The Crossing, uh, they've asked us to um, play some music for them. So for right now, I'm going to, I'm going to switch screens here and I'm going to um, bring on, let's see, where is it? I got to go find it. Bear with me for a moment here, folks. All right, so here's one of our songs from The Crossing, uh, the musical. Is this a folly? To charge the poor for war's expense. I didn't think so when I wrote down common sense. But all these soldiers, what they sold a bill of goods, frozen, shoeless, desperate, abandoned. Freeman not even believe in such news the winds could bring. So far from on high like a sign in the sky shook the world from the lowest to the king. I marched out of Princeton convinced in the wisdom of man who will never know. Thrown every problem from Gibbs Bay to Harlem and now we've no place to go. Cause suddenly doubt is a factor Our leaders we can't quite absolve And so we awaken with deep desperation As fate tests our tepid resolve These are the days, these are the moments These are the times that will try a man's soul 
These are the stakes. These are the torments. Hope and despair vie for who gets control. These are the means. We are the people who haven't forgotten why our fathers came. One congregation, a righteous upheaval, will be remembered but not by our name. Sunshine soldier, the storybook Tory, men without the vim to win. Followed my father, all five of my brothers, anything that would be a sin. The gum and franchise, now what would that feel like for a people long overdue? If they win their freedom, then maybe they'll see that all men long for it too. Times that will try a man's soul. These are the stakes, these are the torments. Hope and despair by for who gets control. These are the means. We are the people who haven't forgotten why our mothers came. One congregation, a righteous upheaval, will be remembered, but not by our name. Our cause is just. And in that fact I trust, it's self-evident, Jefferson said. Oh, we are right, and won't shy from a fight. Is it right to be right and be dead? These ongoing wars and the settling of scores, a tradition firmly affixed. Though often told stories of England's past glories, I'm glad for the ocean between. Then suddenly they're on our doorstep, England would red for their part. And I'd love nothing more than to give them what for, if our leaders would lead us with heart. These are the days, these are the moments, these are the times that will try a man's soul. These are the stakes, these are the torments, hope and despair, I for who gets control. These are the means, we are the people who haven't forgotten why our mothers came. One congregation, a righteous upheaval, will be remembered, will be remembered, will be remembered, will be remembered, be remembered but not by our name. Hope you all like that. <laughs> so I'm going to unmute everybody here in case anyone wants to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. So um, it, uh, it's a lot of fun working on this. I, I think it's um, I think it's an, an important piece of work and uh, I'm looking forward to um, continue to develop this. We're, um, we're looking right now. We're looking for schools to work with the the whole point of this musical people have always asked us well it's going to be on broadway well you know sure why not we'll buy a lottery ticket too but the the point of this is that we're pulling together um a uh, a program that we think that schools will be able to uh use for their students and that's really the whole that's really the whole point of this uh point of this musical so I hope you enjoyed that, everybody. Um, I will uh, send out some information about uh, this upcoming Zoom, about the Thomas Paine celebration, where you're going to be able to hear more of the music. And um, until next time, uh, thank you for joining us on uh, History Author Talks. David, thanks very much. Thank you, Roger. Excellent. Good night, everybody.